Network geplant. This meeting is being recorded. And I'm gonna just remind you guys that this is a meeting, so you can unmute yourself, but I'll just ask you to keep yourself muted while the presenters are presenting. Um, and if you need to say something, use the chat. I'm also gonna um, share a link to Poll Everywhere where we're gonna be collecting some questions throughout the presentation, uh, but that is very soon. Uh, to start, I just wanna say that I'm very, very happy to have you all here. We have about already 100 people uh, and today we're here with Erica, Michael, and Javier. It's a panel form from the All Involved in Incos, and I also want to say thank you for, in for Incos for sponsoring this webinar. That's uh, why we're able to make this free for everyone, um, and I'm happy to be here today. Some society news. Um, I just want to remind people about the benefits of being a member of the System Dynamics Society. You get free access to all society seminar series, the ones that are free and the ones that are not, and also all the recordings from past seminars. You get a great discount on our upcoming conference in July. You get full access to the Society Scientific Journal, the System Dynamics Review. You also get exclusive prices in our bookshop. And if you're planning to learn more System Dynamics, uh, you get access to a pool of society mentors and also discount on our partners' online courses. So if you want to learn more about the benefits of being a member of the society, you can go to systemdynamics.org slash membership. Um, and our conference is approaching very fast. We're meeting in Frankfurt and also online. And <clears throat> it's going to happen from July 18th until 21st in Frankfurt, in Germany. And if you're still deciding if you want to join us online or uh, in person, you can switch to a virtual ticket at, without, without any penalty by May 24th, which is a good perk. Uh, and also you can upgrade at any time to a Frankfurt ticket. Uh, we, are, we still have some early bird rates available, member discounts and scholarships. So you can go to uh, systemdynamics.org slash conference where you can find all the information about the conference and scholarships and all the pricing. And if you wanna learn more system dynamics and start your um, learning or some system dynamics modeling from the best instructors in the field. We have the system dynamics summer school from July uh, 5th to until 8th. Uh, and we have two tracks, the introductory and the intermediate. You can take a test to the intermediate track if you have some knowledge of system dynamics already. And I just wanna give a big shout out to the all to society sponsors. If you want to sponsor the society, uh, you can reach out to me and Rebecca at office at systemdynamics.org. It's only through their help we continue uh, being able to expand the system dynamics. <clears throat> and we're going to be using uh, the poll everywhere to collect our questions throughout the presentation. So if you want to go ahead and maybe scan this QR code on your screen, you can also use the link in the chat. I'm going to do this right now. Everyone in the meeting. <clears throat> I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds to uh, join us in Poe Everywhere so you can engage the presenters uh, with some questions. They're going to be responding at the end of the panel. So we do already have some people responding to this question, Wes, where are you joining us from? So with so many people, I hope that we cover a lot of time zones. I see people from New Zealand. California, United States, of course, Virginia, more specific, Sweden, uh, Ireland, Greece, some people from Europe, <clears throat> Bogota, Eugenia, Nigeria, people from Africa, all continents. It's good to see everyone here. <clears throat> Maybe you can also put in the chat if it, this is the first time you're attending a seminar or the second time or third time. Um, I see people from Germany, Brazil in the chat, um, or else Canada. It's good to have you guys. Welcome if it's the first time, uh, and also the second time. It's good to have you all here. I'm going to move on. You guys got the idea. So we're going to use Poe Everywhere. Soon I'm going to make a live um, Q&A so you can send your questions there. It's the same link. Um, I'll be making it live soon. One. Just a quick agenda for today. 
We have about 45 minutes presentations. We're gonna start with Erica, then Michael, and then Javier. And then we have a lot of time for your questions, uh, 45 minutes for Q&A. And I'm just gonna briefly introduce you to Erica Palmer. She's from Cornell University. Michael Watson from NASA and Javier Calvo Amodio from Oregon State University. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to host you, Erica, Michael and Javier. Um, Erica, that's all from my side. Um, moving the ball to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I could just ask you to un stop sharing so that I can start sharing. And one second. All right. And share screen, start to let you. Okay. Well, I am super excited to be here with you all today. And I was scrolling through the participant list and I was seeing so many familiar names from both the System Dynamics Society and in COSI. Um, a lot of friends in the room and a lot of new names. So I'm excited to engage with all of you. Uh, so Fernando gave um, a bit of a warm up to what I was about to talk about uh, for the session today. Um, I took this in a very traditional and cozy way where we have panel discussions that half the time is not is uh, for the audience, not for us up here speaking. So um, I'll ask that you keep yourself muted until the second half. Uh, and then we want everyone else talking the whole time and obviously talking with us too. Um, but we're here to foster an inclusive dialogue on system science. Uh, and there's a, um, if you feel that there's some things that will trigger you today, that's a good thing. But when your defenses go up, use that as an opportunity to check your ego at the door. <laughs> because when you are pushing the boundaries of knowledge in some way, it's very easy to become defensive and, and, and keep yourself into what feels safe and warm. And this is, this is what you believe is right. But when you get lots of different people from lots of different disciplines who are all coming together on systems, which means different things in different disciplines, uh, use this as an opportunity to engage and learn and perhaps innovate. And if, if there's anyone here who knows me from the, from the System Dynamics Colloquium and uh, those days of fostering an inclusive dialogue with students and more seasoned System Dynamics members, this is also an expression of that atmosphere. Okay, so one of the goals of this session is to have the System Dynamics Society meet in COSI. And I'm, we're gonna talk a little bit about what COSI is in a minute but also for NCOSI to meet the System Dynamics Society. And so I realized that I said, check your ego out the door. And now I'm about to introduce me, Mike and Javier and talk about how awesome we are. And I realized the irony there. So perfectly fine <laughs> to swallow that pill. Uh, but so I've had my foot in the System Dynamics Society and in NCOSI and going back and forth over the last number of years now. But I'm now at Cornell University uh, starting as, and please keep yourself muted as you come in. Uh, the, um, I'm starting as a senior lecturer there and I'm developing three courses on socio-technical systems. Um, I do a lot of encosying. So this top picture here, uh, and I think there's some people in the audience who might recognize themselves. <laughs> uh, I wanted to highlight this. This was a panel that we held a couple of years ago. Uh, but it was on system science, uh, or I'm sorry, bringing social sciences into systems engineering. And in the middle there is Camille Olea, who, and uh, he's in the System Dynamics Society as well. And the bottom is the first PhD colloquium I ran in 2016. And so there are people moving in between, but, and I'm one of them and Camila was one of them, but very often the people in the System Dynamics Society do not know those in uh, systems engineering at all when, or in COSI, uh, but I do see that in COSI knows the System Dynamics Society much better, if that makes sense. So uh, I am the thread chair in for the, system, the International System Dynamics uh, Society Conference uh, that Fernando just plugged uh, for the psychology and human behavior. I'm chairing that with, um, with Camilo. 
And I, as I mentioned, I've been the chair for the uh, colloquium a number of times. I'm also the co-organizer for the conference on systems engineering research. Now on this slide and on the next two slides, it has our backgrounds where and you see it's highlighted are the places where we're belonging to system societies. So there are lots of them <laughs> and we're all moving in between and we're all talking about system science in different ways. Right. So Mike Watson uh, is uh, a NASA, the is sorry the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Advanced Concepts Office Technical Advisor. He's responsible for systems level assessments. He leads the NASA Systems Engineering Technical Discipline Team Research and Technology Efforts responsible for definition of elegant product focused systems engineering. He's also the INCOSI Systems Engineering Principles Action Team Chair and Chair of the Complex Systems Working Group. He is also the Joint Army Navy NASA Air Force Modeling and Simulation Subcommittee Chair. Uh, and he graduated with a BSEE from the University of Kentucky in 1987 and obtained his MSc in Electrical and Computer Engineering in 1996. He also has a PhD in Electrical and Commu Computer Engineering uh, from 2005 from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, so I'm also going to talk about uh, working groups in a minute, but so I have a working group, which is the social systems working group. Mike has a working group called the complex systems working group. And Javier also has a working group, lots of working groups at INCOSI. Uh, so Javier is an associate professor of industrial and manufacturing engineering at Oregon State University, where he directs the change and reliable systems engineering and management research group, CARSEM. His research focuses on developing fundamental understanding of how to integrate system science into industrial and systems engineering research and practice to be enable better uh, engineering of continuous process improvement in organizational cultures. Uh, he has research funding uh, and produced over 70 uh, publications. Uh, with colleagues and graduate students. Uh, his funding is from Oregon's industry, state agencies, and the NSF. Uh, he, Javier received his PhD in systems and in engineering management from Texas Tech. Uh, he has an MS in business management from the University of Hull in the UK and his BS in industrial and systems engineering from Tecnologico de Monterrey in Mexico. Uh, he, as I said, he's part of the system science working group or he's the chair of it. And he's also the deputy editor of the Systems Research and Behavioral Science Journal. He is a fellow of the American Society of Engineering Management, ASEM, and an associate editor for the Engineering Management Journal. Uh, he served as the VP for the ISSS, yet another systems organization, International Society for System Science. And I know that there's a few of you in the audience from there. Uh, and he has served as a VP of research and publications since 2020. Uh, he also serves as a modeling and systems engineering SIG chair for the IEEE. So a lot of systems organizations and a lot of different disciplines that are represented. So I want to give you a little bit of background on INCOSI. Uh, the, both Mike and Javier will give a bit deeper dive into more fundamentals of systems engineering as they go through what they're going to talk about. So I'm just talking about the society um, as a whole. It's a very big organization with standards and certifications and journals and a handbook and the, the system engineering book of knowledge and just so much more. Oh my. Uh, a lot of chapters, 65 plus. Uh, and 77 plus countries and 120 plus corporate advisory board members, which are organizational members. Those also include those um, uh, on the academic council like Cornell is one of those corporate or CAB members. Uh, there's many different activities that are a part of this. And the two main events that INCOSI has every year is its international workshop in January where all the working groups come together to present what's going on in their working groups and also to get them together to stimulate production of INCOSI products. Uh, and then there's the International Symposium, which is every, it's usually every July, but this year it's the end of June. 
Uh, and that's where we, it's a more typical conference where you're submitting papers and there's panels and um, there's tutorials and it's, it's a week long event. Uh, these two, uh, there's many other events throughout the year on the chapter level and then working groups also have their own events. So there's a ton of stuff going on all the time. Uh, and there's a lot of opportunity for both the System Dynamics Society and INCOSI to develop co-events like the one you're attending right now. <laughs> right, so as I said, I'm the chair of the Social Systems Working Group. It has two main purposes. Um, and these are very generic. It's a very new working group. It just got off the ground in 2019. Uh, and it grew out of Mike's working group, actually the complex systems working group, uh, where we got a lot of support from Mike because there were a lot of people interested in how to bring social sciences into systems engineering. And one place to do that was with in, in complex systems. But then as we started to gain some momentum, then we grew into our own group. Uh, so we evaluate evolving changes to systems engineering processes and practices. And we do that by developing measures to integrate the social and socio-technical systems understanding at theoretical, applied, and technical levels. And this is where the system dynamic society part can come in, is in collaboration with outreach initiatives. We are a very open group. We want to bring people in to uh, not just in COSI, um, but bring them into a larger social systems uh, in learning environment. And we have a lot of different uh, um, organizations that come through uh, the group and a lot of people from different disciplines. And what I wanna highlight with that, a lot of different disciplines is we practice in the social systems working group, critical systems thinking. And this is where I feel like we may be triggering quite a few of the System Dynamic Society folks with this. Uh, so please start commenting if you want or sending questions in. Uh, I can also, um, as comments come in, by the way, um, while Mike and Javier are talking, I'll monitor and then I'll, I can bring those into the conversation later. Uh, so because we have a lot of people from a lot of different system societies that uh, come in through INCOSI, and come in through the working group specifically, we really practice methodological pluralism where we are not strict on any particular systems uh, or systemic inquiry practice. The point of the working group is to push the boundaries of what system, systemic inquiry can do. And in this way, and within INCOSI, it's, systems engineering practice and what's included in systems engineering practice. Uh, but we are not hardliners. It's very difficult to innovate and push the boundaries of something if you have hard boundaries. So we have very, very soft boundaries, a lot of osmosis. <laughs> and we want to do this obviously to innovate, but we want to do this not just to innovate for the sake of innovation. We do this because we want to address uh, societal challenges such as those expressed by the National Academy of Engineering's grand challenges, which INCOSI has a focus on, and those that who are in system dynamic society very often are working under the umbrella of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that was a very quick and dirty of critical systems theory, excuse, uh, critical systems thinking, and how, what that means in practice. It's a much larger topic that is grounded in several different waves of system thinking and how system thinking can come together and evolve. Uh, and so I'll leave that up to the discussion later. Um, but from here, I'm gonna pass, sorry, Mike, I have to just pass the mic to Mike, couldn't help myself. <laughs> Let me stop sharing. There you go. Go ahead, Mike, and make sure you unmute yourself. We can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, the unmute's kind of important. Um, but let me pull my slides back up. Can you see my slides? I can see your slides and they are in presentation mode. Awesome. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be uh, talking with you here today. As Erica said, I chair the Complex Systems Working Group within COSI. I also chair the Systems Engineering 
principles action team, and we'll talk about elements of both of those and how they relate to system dynamics. Um, just jumping right into it, system dynamics uh, as part of my research with NASA is one of the six important system modeling types that we have. The others being system integrating physics models, system state variable models, system statistical models, system relational models, which a lot of folks know as MBSE, uh, and system value models. And so system dynamic uh, is a modeling approach that, that provides some important information in a very different perspective than the other models provide and how to understand uh, a system. Um, some of our, my work with uh, uh, INCOSI uh, is leading to a set of systems engineering principles, and that's being published uh, this summer. Uh, I should see that out. Uh, I was hoping June, it may be July before it actually gets out, but uh, you'll see some announcements on that if you uh, receive uh, anything from INCOSI. Um, and what we're doing with that is we're addressing the engineering of systems, right? Uh, and the engineering of systems does depend on system principles, but we're looking at the principles that drive the engineering of the systems. Uh, this does incorporate sociology. As, as Erica mentioned, sociology is a very important aspect in doing engineering, particularly systems engineering, when you're working across large groups of people from various engineering disciplines, scientific disciplines, project management disciplines. Um, it's important to understand how that works. It's also important to understand the social interactions of the system uh, with the users and the operators and the maintainers because that becomes critical in how successful the system actually is, whether you're talking uh, commercial or government uh, purposes. Um, and so it's important to bring that in. So the principles try to put together a set that addresses all of this, and it certainly relates to um, system dynamics. So if I go to the next chart, um, and I'm not going to talk through the principles, but I did, you will note the color coding. If it's not coded, if it's kind of a gray color, that means it applies in, in all contexts, uh, both the, the physical aspects of the system and the social aspects of the system. The uh, green block here, principle two, is really important. It deals with the, the physical aspects of the system. So when you get into the physics and the state modeling, um, those types of things, um, even the, the um, uh, social implications of the application of the system are governed by principle two. Um, and the interesting thing in working with uh, some abstract uh, mathematicians and category theory is they read the principle and said, well, that's basically a mathematical definition of a category. And so we're really looking at that and how category theory plays into uh, understanding systems and understanding then how to properly engineer a system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a minute. Um, principles three and four deal with uh, influences that come from the social side of things that we all have to deal with as systems engineers. Uh, and system dynamics is one of the better modeling tools to deal with these aspects. How to policy and law, how to political influences, economic, social, uh, environmental, technological, how do those influences play uh, into the system and interact with the system? And system dynamics has been shown as a very uh, important and effective modeling approach in doing that. Uh, you also, when you're building any system model, principle five tells you um, that any model is a level of abstraction in the representation of the system. Don't lose sight of the system. The goal is not to build the model. The goal is to use the model to help build the system. And so uh, principle five is really essential for that. Um, looking here again at principle six, uh, seven and eight, principle six is really what we're trying to do in systems engineering is get a progressively deeper understanding. Um, we don't understand fully the system and the implications of the system when we start at the concept level. Uh, we gain that knowledge as we go through the system development process. And when we look at system dynamics, um, you can actually start with a, a with a good system dynamics model in the concept stage, uh, identifying the things that you do understand. And then that can be evolved as you go through the development cycle uh, and helping to support uh, mission context, the understanding of the system itself, elaboration of the system, um, the interactions the system has with other systems, with social systems. Um, 
uh, all these things can, can be captured in system dynamics as well as the system functions and the interaction in the operations environment, whether that's uh, natural, uh, you also have social interactions, as we mentioned. So you can understand these things and system dynamics is a way to do that. It also provides a way to maintain system knowledge. Um, and that's an important aspect uh, to do if we don't maintain the knowledge of systems. And I'm aware of systems where um, the um, engineering documentation wasn't maintained. And then some years later, you're trying to correct an issue and you don't have that knowledge anymore. And one of the ways to address that is through system models and system dynamics modeling is an important part of that suite to do that. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at the models and what we need to have them represent and how we need to maintain them over the life cycle of a system. Uh, system engineering does have to deal with stakeholder needs and the changes and system dynamics actually gives you a good way to model how the stakeholder needs change for the system and how that needs to be adapted. And then principle eight here has two aspects to it. One is stakeholder needs to take into consideration um, a lot of different factors um, in, in what the stakeholders looking at. And what they're trying to do with that is seek a best balance, right? You don't want to optimize a system in any given way. You want to think of it more as the best balance. And system dynamics really gives you a nice framework to balance out the social and the technical uh, and the processes that go on within that, that uh, system activity. Uh, and so it's a very good modeling technique for that. Um, system modeling does account for, system dynamics modeling does account for risk branches. Uh, so you can look at different risks, but if we realize this, what does that mean? Um, it can also contribute to the knowledge and understanding of the full system operational context, because you can model that context um, in, in the uh, dynamic system dynamic structure. Um, it does support the full system life cycle, as, as I note there. Uh, and it provides a fabric. This is really important, principle 12. It provides a fabric to model the complex social interactions that occur during the development of a complex system. Um, when you're talking a rocket or an aircraft or even an automobile, you're not talking five people uh, in an office. You're talking thousands of people geographically distributed uh, across the, uh, the world. And when you're doing that, um, that the complexity of those social interactions uh, gets really highly amplified. And systems dynamics is a good way to capture that and to look at that. Um, system dynamics also provides a fabric to model the data exchange that happens between the different engineering groups, regardless of their geographical location. Uh, and it provides the fabric to understand the engineering discipline interchanges to inform management of the interactions. That's, that's part of why we're modeling. We want to inform ourselves, better understanding, so that we can have uh, better management of the exchange to have a more successful system. And then system dynamics models uh, are, in fact, based on systems theory. Uh, you do capture in some of the physics uh, of the model itself, of the system itself, excuse me. Uh, the logic uh, that may be implemented uh, in the um, system, cyber uh, systems are a good example where it's primarily a logic system. Uh, mathematics uh, is really important in all of this. What is the mathematical basis of what we're doing? Uh, and that's where I'm going to talk a little bit here in a second about category theory. And then sociology is so fundamental to what we do as systems engineers uh, in both how we communicate among the disciplines and also how we assess the impact that the system has, the benefits or the unintended consequences that a system has uh, in its application domain out in society. So a couple of things on managing complexity that are important to remember. The characterization of a system um, architecture um, is, is in terms of the coordinated collection of subsidiary design elements. Um, and that can be a major step toward organizing and managing complexity, is looking at what are the coordinated collections of the design elements. System dynamics can, can be structured in this way. Uh, and that allows us to start to manage the complexity 
um, as we as we look at, at evolution and the architecture of the system and the evolution of that architecture. And then, I've, as I mentioned uh, already, social political complexity is really a big deal. We see it as a confounding factor. Uh, we've done studies. Um, you can take uh, the classic study is the Army uh, steel helmet um, that the U.S. Uh, Army used uh, through World War II. Um, there were a hundred uses for that helmet when they switched the material they lost most of those uses and the impact to the social structure was huge so you would think a, a simple hemispherical shell of metal would not have a very complex interaction yet it did and so that's the thing to understand is how does the system uh, actually affect the social and the political structures that it's going into and being used with uh, that can be a coffee pot that can be an automobile, um, that can be an aircraft, that can be a ship. There's a lot of different things. All those have their impacts and we need to understand those. And that confounds the complexity of the system. Um, and so part of understanding that complexity is getting then into what is the underlying mathematics. Um, and as I mentioned with principle two, um, we became aware that we're actually the definition of a system is the definition of a category, a mathematical category. Category theory is an abstract math that provides the mathematical structure uh, that allows us to properly define systems engineering, actually give us a formal method for system definition, both functional systems and system interfaces. It gives us a formal method for model-based systems engineering constructs, whether you're talking state models, relational models known as MBSC, system dynamics. It gives us a way to start developing these constructs and know um, what, what the right mathematical approach is and what should we be allow, allowed and what is not and what does the representation mean in, in a mathematical sense. Uh, requirements relationships, I, I have a generic uh, relationship uh, shown here on the right. Um, you can see uh, we generally trace down a couple of different ways to trace requirements. One is you're looking at the the physical elements, one is you're looking at the functional relationships. Um, how do we make sense of that, right? A lot of times you'll find nested loops in requirement sets. How do you make sense of that? Well, category theory gives us the tools that says that objects are the physical elements, and that's what I've underlined here. Um, but the verbs are the functions, or in category theory, there are functors, uh, which, which we won't go into today. But, uh, and that's what you see with, with the functional flows. Uh, and so it gives us a way to actually differentiate those mathematically and talk about what the differences are and how to properly construct traceability. Um, that certainly applies to fault trees and su success trees and a form of success tree known as the goal function tree um, that maps goals and functions and system state variables. Um, and so you can see uh, also big data processing, graph analytics, data is isomorphisms and relationships. Uh, are really important to identify so that you're not processing through data that you've already processed through in, in another form, but basically the same data. Uh, composition of knowledge is important. Um, and so uh, these are important constructs. And you see here a, a system dynamics model. This is a, an auto uh, example uh, in the processing manufacturing flow. Uh, and you can see that uh, with category theory, and I'll show it to you here in a second, uh, it focuses on both the objects, um, the stocks, and the relationships or the flows uh, that happen. So it gives us a very clear, clean mathematical definition for those types of concepts. Uh, and so when we look at this, um, a mathematica mathematical category is a construction of objects and the relationships between the objects, providing a much richer structure uh, than that of sets. Um, and so I'm gonna drop out of presentation mode so that we can see the whole chart. Um, and so what we're looking for here is a domain and a codomain. Um, and um, the A map to B, the put in presentation mode has messed my chart up. The A map to B, um, what you see in category theory is this structure, you have an object, um, a and an object B, and then you have a map between them. Uh, and so you have to have a domain, which is A, and a codomain, which is B. You have to have the identity relationship. 
If you don't have an identity relationship, you're probably dealing with uh, a function and not an object. And that's important uh, to understand. Um, you have to uh, support associativity, uh, so that, which then allows us to do composition uh, so that we can compose the maps, the relationships in different ways. And the reason that's shown as a circle is this can be addition, multiplication, this can be a, a, a exponential operation. Uh, there's a lot of mathematical operations that fit uh, within these maps. Uh, they're all allowed and you have a certain rule set that you would bring in that actually then defines the structure of your category. Uh, and that defines what the, this particular operator would be. Uh, and so it gives us a nice way of looking at relationships uh, and how to compose these uh, into basic maps. Um, system representations uh, are comprised of structural elements. Uh, so this is the space launch system. We're uh, in the process of getting ready to launch that. Um, and what you see is system engineering has a holistic system view that includes the system elements, which you see here drawn out as a different components and the interaction amongst themselves, the enabling system and the system environment. So we've got components in a system. We have relationships, physical, logical and human because human crew, human operators, uh, human maintainers. Um, so we have human interactions and the relationships with the environment, both the the natural or physical environment, as well as the social environment. Uh, and so we can see that systems then are comprised of these structured elements. And so category theory um, gives us a, an underlying uh, relationship to um, system dynamics. And so when we look at that um, in category theory, you have objects, relationships, or sometimes called map, domains and codomains, identities, associativity, and composition. System dynamics, you can see the relationship here, stocks, flows. You have a domain and a codomain. You see the mapping here done in this particular system dynamics model. Uh, you're mapping from a domain to a codomain. Um, you have identity functions, your objects are real. Um, the associativity aspect is certainly present in the mapping and the composition of maps. If I follow a, a map structure, I get to a certain point. Uh, can I follow that? point and make, make, make my way back here, composition is important to understand and actually to simplify relationships. It's how category theory is able to um, take terabytes of data that normally take months to process through and do it in a week. And I've seen some examples of that. It's pretty impressive uh, when you see that. And so that's that composition aspect is really, really important. Category theory does define structured sets or structured categories, I should say. There's the category of sets. There's the category of irreflective, irreflexive multigraphs. Basically, we generally call those directed graphs. And that's what you're essentially using in system dynamics is that you have a flow direction uh, with any given link. And then the category of reflexive graphs, which has a feedback relationship uh, among this. And we're still trying to understand reflexive graphs a little bit more and how that works. So system dynamics supports the systems engineering principles. It provides a really good modeling approach for complex system and social interaction understanding. Um, and it does have a category theory model structure. It, it shows itself very nicely applying across uh, or having category theory apply uh, within system dynamics. Uh, and so it provides the ability to deal with complexity then in a rigorous manner uh, and systems are structured as categories. And so we get the tools for system definition, design, modeling and manufacturing. So that's that's my talk. I will pass the ball over to Jose um, Javier. Jose is my my uh, other counterpart. Um, and um, as soon as I can get it back to where it will let me unshare. Here we go. All right, there you go. Thanks, Mike. All right, so I we're going to change uh, change. Can everybody hear? Okay. I think we can hear you now, Javier. You froze up there. Yeah. Just a sec. 
Okay, can is this? Is, is, You're still a bit choppy, Javier. Yeah. Let me turn turn off my camera and see if that works. Has this improved a little bit? Yes, we can hear you more clearly now. Okay. Okay. Let's so let's do this. Okay. How about now? All good? Yeah. Seems very okay. smooth now. Okay. Good. All right. So one one of the biggest things we've been doing at the System Science Working Group is to try to advance our theoretical understanding of theoretical foundations for systems engineering. Now, this has been done in collaboration also with International Society for System Sciences to, to, to a degree, but th there's been, I mean, if through INCOSI, I think through since 2017, we've made huge strides. And one of the biggest things we focus on is is on pre understanding principles, the principles that underpin our the theoretical foundations and our practice, well, both the theory and the practice of systems engineering. Now, systems approaches definitely have been influential because not everything is about formalizing knowledge that we have, but also finding what else can support systems approaches that already exist, such as system dynamics or resources and methodologies, so on and so forth, that can help our um, practice, right? And of course, if my computer, okay, there you go. So to do that, we've been working on highlighting the linkages between system science theory and the empirical practice of, a, of systems engineering at different levels, right? Or different scope and time spans, because there are some things that will take us much longer to clarify, such as what Mike was talking about, category theory, and also how to formalize the theories that, that we have been developing into category theory, formalizing mathematically. And there are other things that we can attack much faster. Now, within systems engineering, we've also been promoting the awareness of system science and systems thinking beyond what a traditional systems engineer will, will be will usually focus right now that includes for instance what erica is doing bringing social sciences into um, into systems thinking and also critical systems thinking and so on and so forth and this as you can see has been encoding what we do i mean systems principles and concepts one of the biggest things that we have found in I mean, not only us, I mean, that if you hear from critical systems thinking, like people like Mike Jackson and Jared Midley and so on and so forth, we have different approaches. Here in, in, with system dynamics, we'll have a set of terminology that is used to represent the approach because system dynamics uses a particular lens to look into problems, which there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, that's what it was designed to do and is really good at solving some kind of problems. And it comes with the own terminology and concepts attached to that terminology. But what we've noticed as, as we as you move through different approaches, we might be using different terms, but referring to the same concept. And in other cases, we might be using the same terms, but we refer to different concepts. So we're trying to come up with a, to a clarification or at least a way for us to be able to talk and, and define what is it that we mean without, without getting to semantical argumentation, because that, that tends to be very counterproductive. And, and of course, focusing on principles that has been the gateway or the entry point for us to start formalizing many things that we do. And then Mike just gave a great example, right? The, the, the outcome of the systems engineering principles, that was a multi-year effort, right, Mike? That, so. Now, the way we see system sciences or what system science does is it helps us bridge where it fits best and where, where we're most, where it's most useful is in space that falls within what we call organized simplicity, that, it, that classical analytical sciences are best at solving problems there, and, and this organized 
complexity, which is which is where the classical statistical sciences do, right? If you if we look at it from randomness as randomness increases, and as complexity increases, that is that is a way for us to to determine and and then. System science focuses on what we call organized complexity. It's something that our classical analytical sciences will struggle with, and I'm, I'm everybody doing system dynamics are, are aware of these, right? There's many ways in which we can model some social aspects. Then we bring system, system dynamics to help us understand organized complexity, right? But also, and, and we we keep on trying to push the boundaries so that we can start tackling a little more of this this organized complexity. So the better that we can move that line upwards, the better. And that that's what we believe the category theory will be a great, great asset for it. Now, within system science, we are breaking it into two different approaches: systems research and complexity science. Just to bring clarity, we've been bringing clarity to this. When we talk about systems research, we talk we are concerned with phenomena that are simple to describe, but turn out to have complex explanations. I mean, the city, I'm, I'm put here a picture of Singapore, right? It, you can describe what you're seeing there, but to, I mean, but to truly explain why that elegance and that emergent system came, came to be, that's not so simple. It'll take a lot of effort to explain all, everything, that gave rise to that. Now, on the other hand, we have complexity science, where it's usually concerned with phenomena that are complex to describe, but turn out to have simple explanations. Relatively speaking, I mean, yeah, swarm of birds is complex to describe, but once we understand the simple relations between each one of the agents, we can understand how that, that happens and it's, it's much simpler. Now, of course, this is not, this is a spectrum, right? It's not like we're at one end and the other. They can and may overlap at some point, both approaches, but it's very important to have the clarity and make the distinction so we can determine how to tackle the problem. And that goes back into what Mike was talking, right? Some principles might be better served using complexity science approaches while others might, be, might benefit more from systems research. Within systems engineering, traditionally, it's been more of an organized simplicity, but we've been pushing it out and forward, right? And that's the effort, and especially bridge, bridging the gap that is in the, on, on the gray area. We also have good models or good approaches here on the disorganized complexity aspect, but what is happening here in the gray one, that's the whole purpose of the system science working group. I'm going to show you something, and I know it's just a puzzle loop diagram, nothing, nothing to um, to advance here. So, so I, I, I didn't go all the way to the to the full stock and flow diagram, but I wanted to keep the original idea. So when we try, this was in 2019 in EMEA sector meeting of Incosi, we had a special meeting for a future systems engineering and scientific foundations for systems engineering and we're working on establishing the relationship with system science systems thinking and systems engineering and to make the case for why we need better system science and basically two two members so john john wave and duncan camp ended up drawing this right so we said well if i want to and if we increase the quality of system science then we have we increase the quality of systems engineering. And eventually, with this delay, right, because that takes some time to, to see that the results, the successful systems will increase. Therefore, our credibility of both systems engineering and systems science will increase. And then we'll have more resources, which helps us invest more on the development of system science, right, because we need funding. So that's a virtuous, virtuous cycle. And that's something we're pursuing, right? And, and, and bottom line, if our and, and as we'll talk talking in, in a moment, this brings us closer to develop to this develop elegant systems, and that's something that Mike is it ha, it, it is is very well versed on that has amazing work on that. Now going back into what I was talking about the concepts and the principles, how do they relate to each other? <clears throat> we can understand it, here. The key is to understand system concepts. And if we can 
normal and we we know what we actually mean by the concepts regardless of the term assigned to them and how they relate to each other that it starts helping that helps us build a system of worldview now let me give you an example if we consider a concept of system and then if we associate it with other concepts such as boundary feedback growth communication level flow control very likely here in the audience you'll be thinking, oh, well, those I'm familiar with all those, right? That those hard concepts assigned or that belong within system dynamics will be, right? That, that's how we can start connecting. And by the way, these lists are not, not comprehensive. But for instance, I could also talk, take the concept realization, life cycle, engineering, social technical, architecture, context, so on and so forth. And then I can start thinking of system engineering systems engineering. Or if I just more general, if I think about relationship, boundary, perspective, distinction, interactions, I might start thinking about systems thinking, right? So an association of terms creates a mental image or there's a pattern and there, there are relationships that come into our, into our head and then we start defining uh, or start formalizing a particular world view. But that's not enough. We also need something else to make sense of how all those concepts may come together for us to understand the world. So we use guiding propositions. And now uh, guiding propositions can be principles and or heuristics to connect concepts and the related phenomena to understand intervening systems. So what I'm talking about here, all human activity systems, right? For it to be considered a human activity system, it must be purposeful. It must have a purpose. If you just have a bunch of people there not doing anything, that's not really a system, it's just a collection of individuals. But once we agree to do something, we become we become a system because there's a purpose. And now whether the intended purpose and the actual outcome match or not, that depends on how successful the system or the human activity, human activity system is, right? You've heard this, that system is what it does. Right, so one thing is what it does, and another thing is what is intended. And our our goal as systems engineers is to minimize that discrepancy between what we want and what actually occurs. Now, very important: all human activities must be aware of their purpose, must agree what the purpose is. They should possess also the necessary causal powers to pursue that purpose intentionally. If we want to have the right resources, the right willingness and knowledge and so on and so forth, we might not be successful, right? So understanding, intervening, for instance, are instantiations of purpose. And those are very typical things that we do as systems thinkers. Now, <clears throat> those guiding propositions are the result of reflection on nature, on values, and or our cumulative experiences as members of communities, right? They, and the, the heuristics, on the other hand, are the result of reflection on practice. But at the end of the day, they follow the same path. And that's why we have this, defined them as guiding propositions because they follow very similar pattern. Now, to give an example, all, all guiding propositions vary in scope, in authority and capability. That means, the scope refers to the variety of contexts in which the guidance works. So if I have a principle, okay, how, how applicable it is, in, whether it's very general or something very specific. Now the authority, how persuasive the guidance is. Maybe remember when we're, when we're small and you touch an outlet, you eventually realize that, oh, you might get shocked. I don't know if that has happened to, to your kids, Erica, but I certainly did a lot when I was two years old finger to outlet, you discover something through experience. Now, you are still not sure that that will happen in others. So you don't know if that, don't, don't, don't put the, 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 the finger into an outlet is very authoritative or not, if it applies to all of them. But if you were to experiment and continue doing it, you'll eventually figure out that, yeah, it's very authoritative. If there's an outlet, don't put the finger in it because you're going to get shocked. <clears throat> so as, as we experiment, as we learn more, the level of authority increases, and hopefully also the scope, because you start seeing, you start generalizing it. Well, the outlet might, may be two prong, three prong, so on and so forth. 
<coughs> and that leads us to capability. And it refers to how predictable the consequences of, of applying the guidance are. And that's where we want to get at. We want to get to a point where we were very good in, in, in at predicting the consequences of doing something. Category theory, again, offers a great opportunity to do this. Let me give you, and now I think that system dynamics is a great, it is great for two things as, um, as a, st a stepping stone into this world systems thinking, because it provides great opportunity for that. But I think it's also great to help us distill guiding propositions. Because for instance, if we go back to this causal loop diagram, because as you know, what we do is that we're telling a story, but then I can understand what happens. And if I simulate and so on so forth, <clears throat> I can move authority, I can increase authority, I can increase capability of something that can derive from here. Because I could say, <clears throat> well, if I focus on how well I realize the system and I manage the life cycles and so on and so forth, I can improve, improve the, so the systems engineer foundations and practice. Therefore, I can increase the quality of system science. I can increase quality of systems engineering and so on and so forth. I can derive something from here. So system dynamics can be a great gateway to develop principles. What I can say is if we, if we start, what, what we're saying is that we can now start looking into compos the compositional aspect of concepts and principles will change how we investigate and reason about things. And certainly will produce systems thinking, right? It will help us then now start recognizing patterns across different phenomena, problem contexts, and disciplines. And that's something key in system science. It is transdisciplinary. We, as long as we can generalize something, we can start seeing whether those same patterns apply. We can communicate across different domains. Finally, you may be thinking, well, what? <clears throat> how does it fit within systems engineering practice? This is this is great, brilliant work from from the Incosi Bridge team that has collaborated with complex systems and working group with spawned here from the system science working group, and they they formalize conceptually how how we do things and how we can integrate principles into what we do. Our goal is to, as systems engineers, at the end of the day, produce elegant solutions. Because an elegant solution resolves complex problems, but those complex problems can stimulate our purpose. Hey, there's a new problem. Hey, there's something else I want to do. Okay, let me see if I can design a solution for it. Now, our purpose will inspire our, our systemic approach as systems engineers. And that systemic approach will influence or shape our practice. And as we get better on that virtuous loop, we increase our ability to consistently produce elegant solutions. And therefore we evolve the value of our of systems engineering as a, as, <clears throat> as a discipline. Now, there's more because our purpose needs to be bounded or we need to get inspiration from somewhere or need guidance. And that comes from our motivation principles. Our systemic approach comes from our transdisciplinary principles, which are systemic in nature. And our practice comes from our technique principles. Basically, we're focusing why we do what we do, what we do, and how we do it. But we have also a couple of, of loops here because the motivation principles are defined or they, they get refined, or we, get, we, we get feedback from our values for systems and their values, what we value, what, what is important to us. Our purpose helps reflect on our value as we go through these loops. And that's how we can keep on evolving the vision. The vision of systems in there was very different 30 years ago than it is now. But also the technique principles require knowledge. And our practice might inform what gaps in knowledge we have. Therefore, we can keep on evolving our capability. That's a big part of where we, that has been influenced us looking to category theory. But finally, where do we get the information? So we have personal values, we have societal values that inform motivation principles and our systems engineering values help us parse which ones are relevant and which ones are not. On the other side, the technique principles come from scientific theories, from practical insights, right? And that helps us either 
go look what is out there. And we have several working groups that do that, natural systems working groups. So we look into different aspects. And finally, holistic perspectives helps us inform our transdisciplinary principles, systems thinking, holism, holonism, design traditions. And I think that this is where system dynamics can be very useful, both bring it, bring it here to help this aspect, but it could also help determine other aspects of motivation, principles, and so forth. So that's that's where I see that we fit. So I'll, I'll let I let people ask questions. I'm clapping for for the whole thing. <laughs> I also want to thank Mike for putting some. You must have seen the ref the the questions that were coming in because you put you're answering some of the questions, Mike, in the um, in the chat yeah. with the reference to the army helmet, but also to category theory. Um, there are quite a few questions on here, uh, and the ones that were most update upvoted are actually now answered that I can see. Um, but for Javier, there's a, um, what textbooks uh, or papers would you recommend for learning more about system science theory and the principles of system science? Hmm, that's an excellent question. I'll, I'll put a, a, a list in, in a moment, I'll collate it and put it here on the, on the chat, but I'll certainly will say, look for David Russo. Right, so his publications on general systems theory. So David, David Russo, he has amazing work on, on the foundations of systems, system science, what is general systems theory. We have we have also I, I co-authored a paper with him on, on systemic semantics, where we're talking about the concepts, there are others about principles and how we do that. Okay, there's a really big noise somewhere. Yes. Hmm. Please mute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Try. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So that <clears throat> that will be it. But and as soon as I get a chance, I will I'll post the um, the the references for those papers. Right, a, a link directly to Google Scholar. I'll give you those links. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank everybody in the chat for the for the conversation we were having back and forth. Um, I. Uh, before we get started with the questions, because please let them come in, I'm also trying to summarize a bit, um, like combining some of the questions. But one of the things, since you are um, an editor for um, the, the Systems Research and Behavioral Science Journal, um, I especially for those that I see, there's a number of students in the room. Um, and I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on where, systems engineers and um, system dynamicists can come together um, on really hot topics that are at the forefront of what um, that journal wants to see. I, I think right now will be a, yeah, definitely a, a great, great time to submit to systems research and behavioral sciences. Because I mean, that's one that I, I'm definitely promoting opening more to engineers, right? And, and as long as, I mean, there's an, it has to be a systems-based approach, right? That's that's key for, for our journal. But if, if you're dealing with some behavioral aspects or some cognition aspects or how to improve practice involving humans, that'll be a great place. Now, I, I must say that one thing that we're looking for are journal papers, right? So if, if you're basing it from your PhD thesis or dissertation, you will expect you to put enough, enough work for it to read like a journal paper, not like a thesis or a report on a thesis or a dissertation. We, we had that discussion not too long ago in, in, in and we want we want to maintain that that standard. That that is not to mean that we wouldn't be willing to help or give some pointers how you can achieve that. Um, now there's also journal systems from MDPI that might be a, that is also a good source of current knowledge, especially more focused on systems engineering. 
and, and system science, but it has a lot of systems engineering and know and materials there. You might also want to consider submitting to the International Society for System Sciences because we do have a student student competition, so student paper competition. And if if a prize is awarded to your paper that it gets that is selected to be published in SRBS. So you get both the accolade of receiving a very prestigious award, but also the opportunity to publish on SRBS on systems research and behavioral science. This is another, that's another aspect, um, path that you may follow. Did I answer the question? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, Fernando, can I, uh, now you're sharing your screen. Could, yeah. um, where are we in terms of addressing the ones that have been most upvoted? I know Michael yeah. also got a lot of questions. Um, this, this link that actually is already in the, one. yeah, that one's already in the chat. This one was so, in the chat, okay. Yeah, well, or, you, so this group in here, I understand that system dynamics fits into the structure of category theory is less clear what the value that provides in practical sense. So what category theory is <laughs> doing is it's giving you the mathematical, um, formulation, the mathematical rules that to a certain extent we're using, but we're not always fully recognizing. And when we, we fail to follow the math correctly, we will get errors in our modeling. Um, I see that a lot in SysML. Um, and so what category theory does is it helps us to identify where the limits really are. And a good historical example of that is Vitruvius, right? The Roman architect um, from who published his works in like 65 BC. Uh, and if you read through his works, it's pretty good. Um, you see the basic foundations of city planning and mechanical engineering and civil engineering. And, but he doesn't talk about it like that, right? He's given you what um, Javier just talked about with heuristics uh, and, and some language that looks a little bit like principles, right? What he's not giving you is, well, here's the, the engineering law. Here's the mathematical relationship. This works because the reason it works is we tried it and it worked, right? And, and we tried it over a hundred years and it's worked. So we're going to say that this is good. When you get to um, bridge building, you see the same thing. And bridge building had reached its limits by 500 AD, 800 AD. They weren't getting any bigger or better. They, we, we were just repeating the same things over and over and over again. It was a thousand years that they went like that. And then Galileo came up with the idea of the strength of materials. He actually initially stated it wrong. He had the uh, conversion factor or a scaling factor that was incorrect in it. And uh, it took a, a Frenchman another hundred years to correct that. But that's how we build these long span bridges today, because we know the strength of materials relationship. It defined for us not, not only the limits of what we had, we're currently doing, but it showed us the path and how to go beyond where we are uh, and how to do that safely and effectively and successfully. And that's what category theory is doing. I think SysML, I think system dynamics, uh, somebody was asking about agent-based modeling, I think uh, ABM, I think all of that uh, underlying is following uh, elements of category theory. Where those models are failing, you'll probably find some violation in the mathematics of the category structure. Um, and so that's the practical side of it, is helping us to understand, be more successful, and move forward, advance in our system understanding and our ability to model very complex and complicated systems. I think you also hit on something really important that I'd like to highlight, Mike, was that this sure. reciprocal nature between science and engineering and engineering not just being applied science. And then that, you know, the innovation happens when there's this open conversation in between the like two different philosophical approaches for, you know, pushing the boundaries of what we can do, how we can transform right. the world, engineering versus what we know about the world. So, and right, that's almost, a great point, Eric. So, um, Fernando, um, what else is what, what's yeah? Next? Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> that one is in the chat. 
Okay. Yeah, I posted that, I mean, that article, and the article that I posted also has the reference to the oris original newspaper article, I think it was, <clears throat> uh, that kind of uh, had studied that, so. That's a great mm -hmm. question for Javier, you... and that's actually something we're struggling with a little bit at Cornell. So, no, yeah. can you can, can I suggest, um, Erica? Can you read out, out loud the questions just because in the recording it's better when someone is following along with the recording and you just read sure, out. Sure, yeah, no, the, not the a questions. problem. So, why are there so few academic programs in system science in comparison to systems engineering? Is this a problem? And for you, I'm sure you have a whole bunch of stuff to say on that, Javier, but I just want to point out that. You know, one of the goals of what we're doing with the systems engineering program at Cornell is we are trying very hard to find ways to bring the system science into the systems engineering uh, education itself. Uh, but Javier, this was for you. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. Well, where do I begin? <laughs> Without, um, I'll just drop my little violin. No, it's. Every, I think, at least here in the US, everything goes back into funding. And funding agencies are not very keen on funding this. And so we have to be creative. And also within the, within the university, the universities don't know what to do with the system science program because it has to be transdisciplinary. And not only interdisciplinary, I mean, it needs to be transdisciplinary. It needs to cut across colleges. And that brings such a level of headache that universities are not built to handle it. They, I mean, I, I know they're being very blunt, but that's, that's the reality of things, right? I, I tried. And that was a very successful program in Portland State University. And it just died because, I mean, you might at some point get all the deans to agree and all that, but then deans come and go. And then as long as one doesn't like it or doesn't buy it, that's it, you're, you're gone. And, and also securing funding for this is very difficult. I mean, that's a joke that we should say that the, for the NSF to be successful, you have to have already done the project for them to give you the money to do it, right? So um, how can we do that? Hey, we're actually battling that question, right, Mike, with, with category theory, and we keep on ba bumping our heads because nobody sees the value, and it's very difficult to articulate it if you don't have clear examples to show, to demonstrate, hey, this works, but then we need money to develop those examples. So it's, it's um, as you can see, I, I'm pretty sure you all started already picturing the causal, uh, causal, causal loop diagrams over there and how this can be, what the problem is, right? We're stuck in, I, I would say this a little bit like, like a um, fixes a fail, then, or drifting goals for it, or drifting goals archetype where, we keep on trying, but they keep on moving the, the, the goalpost and then we can keep on changing. So the goalpost keeps, in, keeps moving. They keep on moving the goalpost. So uh, I wish I could give you a, a more elegant or sophisticated answer, but it's very mundane, the reason really. But we're trying. Oh yeah, for sure. That's an important oh, I, thing to highlight here. <laughs> I, absolutely, I, all, all my academic career has been about system science. Right, but I had to get super creative by making it look like everything I do is engineering management or systems engineering, something applied. But in the background, we're working on developing the theories. But it's it's slower because there's just so much hours during the day that I'm willing to put into this because I like work-life balance, right? So, and my students also need to sleep and that kind of stuff, right? So, <laughs> all right. So there thanks, you go. Javier. Okay, Fernando, could you go to another one? Another. Uh, highly... Let's move on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, question. Another one for Javier. Um, I think actually he put this one in the chat, didn't you? The, um, True. The answer to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I highlighted um, <clears throat> there. Just I want to, to 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 highlight. I put there a lot of links. Work from David Russo. There's one of them is a book, but also I highly recommend looking to latest Mike Jackson book because it provides a good background on theory and they're complementing <clears throat> the approaches. I'll go. I'll go through this chat um, after this webinar, and I'll, I'll, we usually create this blog with recording and other resources. So I'll go through the chat and make sure that I include these um, um, books and other recommendations to in the blog. Okay, everyone is watching. 
So one thing caught my attention, comments from Mike, we need to help build the complex system and this helps development of a complex system. This is quite different from the underlying philosophy of system dynamics and the emphasis is often on trying to understand an existing system and adjust. Mike, you wanna take that? Uh, I'll give it a shot. So uh, the idea of complex systems are developed by complex systems mean that uh, complex systems are developed by social systems and the social system that's developing that, the organization that you're in is the complex system. So it's a little different than I think what you're talking about and the underlying philosophy. Um, you can certainly understand an existing system uh, and adjust. We do that when we are modifying a system or when we have what we call a heritage system and we're adapting that for something new. Um, that is certainly something that is done within engineering. Um, but what the principal is talking about is, is you have to recognize that uh, when you're building a rocket or um, a new transport ship or um, even a car, that the organization itself that is required to build that complex system is itself complex. In fact, somebody mentioned the cognitive le levels and all that. If you have more than one person in the room, you have a complex system. And some would argue if you have one person in the room, you have a complex system. So by definition, social systems organizations are complex. So I don't know if that I, I, addresses I, it or not, but. I also like, I think this also requires a bit of code switching from systems engineering and system dynamics. So I'll also give it a shot, given that I sure. have a foot in each of the worlds. Um, I think uh, really it's uh, the, talking about the same things on two different planes that are overlapping each other. So um, within systems engineering, and to, to, to back up Mike's point is that, and I always make the argument that all systems are socio-technical systems as in all, and when that happens, they all become complex because the social part is added. And so in system dynamics, like it's it's folk exactly as you said, understanding the the existing system and then adjusting. And when you're looking in systems engineering, you're looking at the engineered product um, or system as a product, and then you're trying to understand or you're to help build the complex system that because you're reaching that technical system, the actual engineered product out into the social domain into all those different social systems that then connect to it because you're trying to build a product other than rather than in system dynamics when you're modeling a system you're trying to understand the ex existing system and then if there, there's a problem and then you're building a policy to fix the problem but it's not focused on the the production of a product in the same way that systems engineering yeah. is does that yeah. make sense and, and if, I, if I may, I, I probably can, can add a little bit more because I've also dipped my toes on system dynamics. And I think in certain applications of systems engineering, it, it, what, what system dynamics says is, is true if we already have like a long-term project that is repetitive, right? But many of the problem, but those, I think we have fairly good tools. That doesn't mean that systems engineer, a system dynamics couldn't be incorporated. But sometimes we're thinking of a one-off mega project that there's nothing to base it off. This is completely new technology, completely new, everything is new. And that's why system dynamics might, might become very difficult to apply because there's nothing to base it off, right? That's, that's one of the biggest problems that we're facing, right, Mike, that it, how do you design a new SLS, right? There's no previous knowledge of doing that, right? I mean, you try to base it as much as possible whatever existed, but there's a lot of unknowns that you need to come with a different approach and you need to embrace that complexity. Hopefully we'll eventually develop an elegant solution, right? But it, it makes it very difficult. I've been also trying to add some of the acronyms that are very common and in COSI into the chat, like MBSE and SOS. So. Uh, if there is anything that's confusing to anybody, just ask in the chat and I'll answer. And I understand why it won't make sense to 100% of the crowd. <laughs> so, okay, maybe we should move on to a new question. Um, 
Can you suggest further introductory reading on category theory? Yeah, this one is already in the chat. I so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just be aware mm. that it's going to be, it's written by mathematicians, so it's a little headache. How would you differentiate between detailed complexity and dynamic complexity? Well, we need to ask Mike this question because he is the complexity guru. Yeah. <laughs> huh. um, you, so I would have to ask what what is meant by detailed complexity and dynamic complexity, right? Um, and what you run into with complexity, um, well, let, let me just back up. So we did a paper, I posted it. It's the one that has the pot helmet in it. Uh, or the army still him in it, but we did a paper and basically what we showed is systems are not simple, complicated or complex. Every system has a set of characteristics which can be complex and the uh, complexity of those characteristics varies by system quite a bit. It also varies by the confounding factors which we identified as um, social um, environment and uh, the application of um, artificial intelligence. Um, now, those are two confounding factors. There are probably others. Um, and so that's some future work to go forward with. But when you talk about system dynamics, it is a characteristic of complexity, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the system is complex in and of itself. It means it has a complex characteristic. And that gets into the other uh, to another characteristic called multi perspective. Right. And I put something in the chat related to that where I take a rocket. Uh, I can basically disassemble a rocket. I showed you an exploded view of, of the space launch system um, into its piece parts and I can assemble those. Uh, and so that that perspective is what a lot of people would say is complicated. Um, yet when I fly the rocket, it's complex because we don't understand all the fluid dynamics completely. Um, when you don't understand something, what do you do? You build containment boundaries um, so that if it behaves in a way that you didn't expect, you can still continue to function. Um, and so uh, the two different perspectives give you two very different answers on whether the system is complex or not. And that's what you find in complex systems. So when you talk about detailed complexity, um, somebody was asking about the microscopic level. Um, uh, I think what you're talking about is, is the structural complexity uh, of, at, uh, of the parts, which in general is not very complex because of the way we know how to engineer things today. Um, and the um, functional operational complexity, which is complex because we know how to put parts together to create um, uh, very complex responses. Uh, we can build artificial intelligence, for example. Um, so not sure that, I, that if I'm answering the question completely or not, Javier or Erica, if you've got anything you want to add to that, that would be great. There's been some chatter in the chat uh, going on. Um, so um, I maybe if you're I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, yeah. Jim Foley, maybe if you want to unmute yourself and maybe add something. Well, in the meantime, Jim does it. I just want to highlight what I what I put in there and in and, and, and it was an, an intent also to complement what Mike was saying and to showcase how we're shifting the way we look into complexity. Right in, in, and this is a sim, um, somewhat sim, simplistic analogy, but I think it helps because bottom line, what we've been saying is that as a systems perspective can embrace both system reductionistic and holistic arguments. They are not uh, at odds with each other. Like you sometimes see it's been portrayed in different systems society or by, by systems, systems thinking groups. They are complementary. They are, there's a good place for one and the other. And that, that goes back to what Mike was saying, depending on how you're looking at it, the, the kind of complexity is going to change. So this is very important. We have different kinds of complexities and degrees of complexity. So we may have a type of, a, a kind of, there's physical complexity, but the, the degrees can, can, the degree of complexity can increase. 
And that, that's maybe where we can start finding complicatedness and so on and so forth. But we can also jump to a different kind of complexity, or my, maybe biological or cognitive complexity, right? But there's also going to, there will also exist degrees. But in, for some kinds of complexities, a reductionist argument is going to be more appropriate, right? It fits better or it gives us enough, enough value, right? This authority is large enough that there's no need to engage into something else, but we'll get to a point where we'll require holistic arguments and we'll require a holistic approach to make sense of the kind of complexity that we're experiencing. So that's, that's a little more of a theory that goes, that, that supports the right of the repo in there. Okay, I think we can move on. And I saw a question yeah. that I was really tempted to answer, and um, yeah. if that's okay. <laughs> um, Definitely, Erica. Can you pick? Maybe this is the last one we, we approach at the end of the. the oh, okay. Well, the then, what's the most up, what's the most upvoted one? People are asking for the resources. Okay. Like, well, the slides, presentation, <laughs> slides, and um, okay. Well, chats, well, actually, I've been, then, then if you don't mind, I'd like to answer the last question that just came in it, where it says um, in system dynamics, we often talk about, it's the one right at the top. Um, um, I can read yeah. it from my screen. In system oh, dynamics, you, yeah, we often talk <laughs> about the dynamic problem and the reference mode then try to model the system with the dynamic problem in mind. What might be the code switch for systems engineering approach? Um, so the reason I wanted to answer this is because it's not really a straightforward, you have to use these terms versus you know, the system dynamics terms. The, the approach is different uh, completely uh, in a lot of ways, but in other ways it overlaps. Uh, when, but one of the things I wanted to talk about like to the system dynamicists who want to engage with um, within COSI, for example, the best thing, like there are many simulation modeling tools that they use, uh, like, or that systems engineering use. Uh, and, and system dynamics uh, modeling is one of them. Uh, and it's a very powerful tool and a lot of people do use it, but they, because they're not necessarily associated, associated with the system dynamic society, you'll see that they're not using system dynamics modeling in the exact prescribed way that you are directed to by those that teach system dynamics, uh, you know, under the umbrella of the system dynamics society. Uh, so one of the things I always recommend too is when you're talking about system dynamics in, in COSI, talk about simulation modeling. You're doing simulation modeling. Uh, you are, if you are working with some sort, like for instance, transport systems is a really great overlap between system dynamics and, uh, and, and in COSI because you're, there's a lot of work that's going on in the same area there. Uh, and so if you were to take trans, like a transport problem, you know, in systems engineering, you know, we talk about things like requirements a lot that that's a very important thing to understand when you're coming from the system dynamics world. Now, when you go in and you use the prescription for, okay, you have a dynamic problem and you have the reference mode and you have a dynamic hypothesis that then produces the reference mode behavior. A systems engineer at Encozi who's never worked with system dynamics in a, in a structured non-self-taught way will not understand what you're talking about at all. <laughs> so you have to be very open and listen and, and realize when you are talking about the same things and when, and when you think you are talking about different things, try to figure out what the boundaries of those differences are and if, there's, if it's possible to find that point of innovation. Uh, so this was the, I guess the last point it was kind of a good thing to end on. <laughs> Uh, Fernando, is there anything that we should be saying for wrapping up or? Yeah, you can wrap up. I was just going to say thank you to you guys. Thank you so much, Erica, Michael, and Javier for making this possible and giving your time. I'm seeing some comments on the, in the chat that saying thank you and really enjoying this time with you guys here. Um, I would invite Rebecca, Rebecca Niles, uh, the executive director of the System Dynamics Society, maybe for something 
to some final words. Rebecca, are you here? <clears throat> Seeing you. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Fernanda. Sorry, I was trying to get the buttons they weren't doing for me. I wanna thank the folks from NCOSI. It was really um, nice to get an education on the, the difference between you know, the systems engineering and system sciences field mm -hmm. and, and how we're connected um, and different so that we can learn from each other. And we're looking forward to learning more and connecting more with, with this group in the future. So thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, as Rebecca said, Erica, we're really looking forward to continue building this relationship with Incos. Uh, of course, we can continue this uh, conversation between us and get some feedback from everyone who attended this webinar. Um, I'm sending you a link via email for us for you to give some feedback. Um, it's really important for us and help us improve. Uh, well, thank you so so much again, Erica, Michael, and Javier. If you maybe Javier and Michael, if you have some final words, you're welcome to say them. Oh, no, just thank you all for the um, opportunity to come and uh, talk a little bit about the, the work that we're doing and um, the relationship with system dynamics. I certainly think, as I said, that's an important, very important fundamental modeling type that needs to be applied more broadly, I think, in systems engineering. So thank you all. I completely agree with Mike. So nothing, nothing else to add, but I just show my appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Fernando, can I just ask a quick question? This sure. Is, we can stop the recording though. Yeah, I will. Let me see.